Welcome to this presentation on validity of acceleration via a local positioning system for game sports. There are three main ways how to track position, which are GPS, video based or radio wave based systems. Among these, radio wave LPS, local positioning systems, send ultra wideband signals from transponders to stationary receivers, which is seemingly known to be the most accurate of the systems. And this is why it is so popular in game sports. There are various purposes how to use it and apply it in game sports and all of them build on positions. So you can calculate speed or acceleration, but the problem is that with each derivative the errors accumulate and increase. If you want to work with speed or acceleration you can either calculate peak values which are relevant as key performance indicators or you can use the entire time series. A quite powerful model allows to use the instantaneous acceleration and to estimate energy cost without using any spirit ergometry. And this is so powerful because it can be applied in real matches. So this leads to increasing popularity and adoption in game sports, despite much uh, critique. And one of the most fundamental crit critical aspects was whether the time series acceleration is accurate enough for this model or not. Currently, it doesn't look so good. A very recent review on LPS validation studies can be summarized as follows. Many of the studies did not investigate acceleration. They lacked highly dynamic movements. They confused correlation with agreement. And overall, time series and peak acceleration showed poor validity. However, of course, technology always advances and a new system developed by a Taiwanese company was uh, introduced and we wonder whether it's accurate enough or not. We simultaneously measured LPS data with four receivers at a sampling frequency of 50 Hz and we compared the data with Wicon data using four cameras, one marker on the top of the transponder. We had some backup markers, markers in case we needed to fill some gaps and the f uh, frequency was downsampled to match the LPS frequency. Typical game sports elements were covered in the movements we investigated. They were repeated 10 times per intensity at low intensity and high intensity, which makes a total of 80 repetitions for accelerations and 80 decelerations. Both systems were calibrated properly. The LPS did not require any data processing because of an integrated algorithm and Vicon data was Butterworth low pass filtered at 1 Hz after finding the optimal filter frequency using FFT and residual analyses. Both datasets were synchronized via horizontal time shift until the minimum root mean square error was obtained. Concordance correlation coefficient is a suitable statistical tool to test agreement between two sets of data. In addition, root mean square error was calculated. Plant Altman plots were depicted for peak values only and ANOVA tested differences in root mean square error between intensities and tasks. As you can see, the concordance or agreement in time series was around 77% at low intensity and around 85% at high intensity. Acceleration peak concordance was around 48% and deceleration peak around 73%. On the left side, to get an impression how the data looks like, you see the weakest of all time series concordances we had, and on the right side, you see the strongest concordance. Here on the left figure, you see the difference between low and high intensity. At high intensity, errors were larger, significant in time series and both peak values. And on the right side, you see the differences across tasks, significant for time series and peak acceleration with the same trend for peak deceleration. And the largest errors were found in the shuttle run. The plant altman plots reveal us that there are some trends going on. There is a relationship between the magnitude of acceleration or deceleration and the error. 
and there was a significant correlation between the magnitude and the error. The larger the magnitude, the larger the error. So overall, the concordance in time series was solid. For peaks, not so much. In fact, it was poor and moderate. We observed increased errors at high intensity. And the larger the acceleration and deceleration values have been, the larger the errors. Noteworthy is also that the errors have been task dependent. And the largest errors was found in shuttles, which can be explained due to the fact that shuttles involved the sharpest turns, so the smallest change of direction angles, and they also had the largest acceleration and deceleration values. What does it mean for application purposes? I would not recommend to use analyses that heavily rely on peak values. This could be, for example, to predict fatigue based on declining trends of peaks. But it can be recommended to use time series to estimate energy. I would be careful when it comes to high intensities or an unusual high proportion of changes of directions. For example, this means I would not estimate energy based on time series in a very short time for high intensity exercise drills, but it seems to be okay to calculate the total energy during an entire match, for example, where there is a lot of low intensities involved. I want to wrap up with some take-home messages, which maybe are helpful for some. Um, when dealing with validation studies, check the statistics if agreement was tested or only relationship, and is it what you need? Second, what were the specific conditions in the validation studies, and is the tool valid for what you plan to do? This includes the tasks that were investigated, the variables calculated, the ways how the system was applied, and the settings that were used. Very important for acceleration is the sampling frequency in this regard. Be careful with high intensities and when you need peak values. And it is recommendable to use time series accelerations in mainly low or moderate intensities over a longer time period, for example, the entire match. Thank you for your attention and this is the literature reference list.